Good afternoon. Welcome to the British Phycological Society's public lecture at the end of our annual scientific meeting in Nottingham. Appropriately, on a day when many of us are surrounded by snow, we're going to explore the fascinating world of polar microbiology. Our guide on this trip is Anne Jungblut, who works at the Natural History Museum in London and who is also a natural National Geographic explorer. Anne studied in Germany and Australia and worked in Canada before she came to London. Her research focuses on the microscopic world and understanding how organisms that are invisible to the naked eye can thrive in some of the most hostile environments on Earth. She's led several expeditions to both the Arctic and Antarctic and published many papers and book chapters describing her findings. Her talk this afternoon is entitled Life in the Extreme, Polar Microbiome Research from the Expedition of Captain Scott to Climate Change. Anne, over to you. So, hi. Yeah, hi, I'm Martin. Many thanks for the introduction. I will now share my presentation. OK, that's great. All right. Yeah. So, yeah, thanks a lot for um, your introduction and thanks a lot for the invitation to um, yeah share a little bit of the work I'm doing and talking about like about my um, trips to the polar regions. Um, yeah, and I'm looking forward to um, yeah telling you about um, life in the extreme. So um, first, before I start talking about uh, more about science, I thought I go back where where I'm back where I'm based and where I'm coming from. So I'm based at the Natural History Museum in London in the United Kingdom. And um, yeah, you probably know the museum for it's really old building. Um, it's really pretty. It's really old. There's a big statue of Darwin and it has lots of dinosaurs. And now we also have um, the, the whale hope. Um, and so that's um, what the museum is known for. But it also um, has a lot more to offer. So only really the minority of all um, old specimens that are at the museum are on display in the galleries, but actually there are up to 80 million museum specimens that are behind the doors in the cabinets and the drawers. And so the 80 million museum specimens, they range from um, botanical um, plant specimens, zoology, insects, minerals, um, fossils, um, but not just dinosaur fossil, but also plant fossils. And increasingly, we're also collecting more and more DNA collections because a lot of science is done with DNA sequencing. So we have a molecular collection facility where we keep where we have big tanks where DNA samples can be kept frozen. And so we have this really big collection, but we're not just have the collection. We actually also do a lot of science. So we have up to 300 staff in a life science and air science department. And we're very much like, um, yeah, research institute or universities where we have research groups. We have curators that look after the collections. We have PhD students. We have master students. And um, all of us, we are. Yeah, we're working on a range of research topics and that range from biodiversity, climate change, um, sustainability and the evolution of our um, biodiversity and also um, our solar systems. And because we are a museum, we're really interested to work with the public. So we have quite a few citizen science projects where we work together with the publics to discover biodiversity and um, yeah, understand what the ecology is of the biodiversity. So what am I doing? So I'm a environmental microbiology in the life science department. And in my research, I'm interested to um, discover the microscopic life to study the ecology, it's, it's the distribution and um, study also the environments to see how they might be affected by climate change. And yeah, a lot of my work is um, taking me to the polar regions. Um, so the Antarctic and the Arctic, they are, they are, they are, well, they're the poles. And so the Antarctica is our south, is the southernmost continent that's um, surrounded by the Southern Ocean. And the Arctic um, is comprised of the Arctic Ocean and the um, surrounding land masses. And so before, yeah, I talk more about the environments, the habitats the, and the animals we find there. I thought I include a few slides talking of how we actually get there because it's an awfully um, um, far away place. And um, yeah, they're not just commercial planes where we can travel to. 
And the way we get to Antarctica or the Arctic really depends um, on where you want to get to and um, what logistics are available. And so when I work with the British Antarctic Survey, we often travel to South America and then we go on a boat and travel um, to Antarctica, like here for the James Clark Ross, which will be soon replaced with the Sir David Attenborough um, ship. And so, yeah, so we go to South America and then we go on a ship, spend several days on a ship and go from there to Antarctica. But another way to get to Antarctica is also to fly with, um, with the US military. And from there, we, for example, travel to New Zealand and then go on one of those big um, planes with the US Air Force and um, travel to Antarctica. And it's usually quite bizarre because, um, so Antarctica in, in winter, winter nobody, nobody, hardly, body, hardly anybody can go there. And so most of the work is done in summer. And so, um, yeah, we travel to New Zealand in November, December when it's summer there and it's really warm. And on the morning when we fly to Antarctica, we have to put in our cold weather gear and we're all rocked up and have to go into the plane for a long flight. And so these are, um, they're really cool planes, but they're not like commercial planes. And so, so here you see all of us ready to fly to Antarctica with our cold weather gear in one of those um, um, airplanes. And so we go into the plane, we sit there, there aren't any windows, and then when the door opens, we're suddenly in Antarctica. So the New Zealand and US program, they have combined, um, they share the logistics and the planes land on a big ice sheet. So actually where the people are walking is ice. And so it's just an amazing um, yeah, way to get to Antarctica. And so once we, we are there, we then, um, we then go to a station. And so now here, for example, you see one of the stations um, by, um, well, by the South, jo South Georgian government and British and Antarctic Survey. And so there, yeah, we live in really um, luxurious um, places and have friendly visitors. And other stations I've worked in is like the New Zealand station, so Scott Base, um, also which is just an amazing station with amazing people and great logistics support. So we usually get there, we have health and safety training, we pack all our gear, our field gear, a lot of chocolate, and once we're ready, we then um, are, um, are being transported to our actual field site where we then do camping. And so again, there are different ways. So here is like when we're in South Georgia. So we go sometimes on little boats to get our um, to our field sites. And other ways when we're in more remote places like in the McMurdo Dry Valleys, we get, um, yeah, we pack everything up and it get put in by helicopter. So there you already see there's lots of logistics involved from um, packing up, packing your backpack to actually get to your field site and collecting your samples. And then, yeah, and then there are lots of range of field locations. So this was again, um, working with the US Antarctic um, program where we're in this amazing camp where a camp manager who writes food and it's just really luxurious um, place for actually being at, yeah, at the bottom of the world. And so there we have these amazing places. And then we have probably, this is one of my most favorite campsite, which is just next to a glacier. So it's just amazing to be there and get, getting up in the morning or actually there, um, there is 24 hour daylight. So you can get, get up in the middle of the night and it's sunshine and it's just an amazing place to be. So then um, there can be slightly smaller setups. So this is one campsite where we had like one of those green boxes where we did the cooking and then the sleeping in the tents. And then again, an even slightly smaller version is where we only had a set of camp next to a big glacier where we stayed for two weeks. So then, yeah, once we're there, when we set off a camp, we do all range of types of field work. So some of the work is in lakes and some of them are ice covered, some are in streams, some are in soils, and they all require a different type of field work and sample collection. And some of the work I'm doing with people in New Zealand and the US is studying life in ice covered lakes. <coughs> and for that, um, we have to drill a big hole in divers go sampling. So I myself, I don't do any diving, but my colleagues do. And so here you see how one of my colleagues is just let into the water and he's going to dive under the ice and collect samples for us. So other type of sampling is so here, that's in Svalbard, where we um, worked in the, with the um, 
Polar Center in the, with the Czech Republic. So here we're in Svalbard and we're studying life and rocks. And for that, we have to, um, yeah, we have to go for long walks. And then we have sample collection and measurements at the site um, to, to really understand the ecology of, of our samples. And so, yeah, and so some hikes are a bit shorter and some are a lot longer. And so, yeah, so there's a lot of walking um, required um, when we do our field work. Then once we have our samples, we usually have to do a lot of processing. So we spend a lot of time in small um, cold huts where we have to do a lot of um, labeling of tubes and um, writing the names and the dates on it that when we get back um, to our home institution that we still know what we collected and we um, we study our samples doing um, photography. Um, we're also interested in water. So at the bottom you see how we filter um, samples. And yeah, so there's a lot of processing required when we are in our teams um, in Antarctica to get the samples in a way that we can take them home and then do we science that we need to do the science that we need to do to address our research questions. Yes, yeah, so how, how does the environment look like and what friendly creatures can we run into when we are in Antarctica? So here, for example, you see the beautiful shorelines of South Georgia, which has a huge biodiversity of animals and mammals and birds. And for example, one of the friendly faces that you can see when you're there are these fursuit pups. They're very cute, but they're already very vicious and you sometimes have to watch out that they don't come to run after you when you're there. And so here, yeah, so this is the first seal pup that was born that year, so it would have been um, just a few months old. And then you here see an elephant um, seal um, pup, so it's not that small, but it's still relatively small to the adults um, that you might have seen in other documentaries. Other um, things you see are these beautiful um, albatross birds. So you see an adult there with its really cute chick, which I think just looks like a character out of the Muppet Show. And um, and then you go to, as people know, the really famous and beautiful birds. So South Georgia Island has like the largest um, king penguin colonies. And so here you see the adults, which have the gray and white, and then the orange sides. And then you have the chicks, which still have this kind of teddy bear um, feathers in brown. So these are the king penguins. And then you have the slightly smaller ones. These are the Adele, Adele penguins that are on Ross Island, and where you have the most southerly um, Adele penguin colonies um, in the world. And so you have, yeah, you have this huge um, diversity of wildlife along the coasts. But then I'm a microbiologist, so why would I go there if it's all about like penguins and, and fur seals and whales? And so why should I really care about microbes and ice and water? Um, and so I want to spend the next slide to just talk about why I think it's really important and really cool to study microbes. And so for this, I've got this slide. So this slide, what you see here is, um, is basically a big family tree. And it's, it kind of puts every, everything that lives in one, one tree. And the major groups, how we divide our life on Earth is in these, we call the domains of life. And we, um, we have one big domain that is all the eukaryotes, so all the animals, the plants, the fungi, um, the seaweeds, everything in one group. And then you have the microscopic thing like the bacteria and the archaea. So the archaea are very dis are kind of the same the size and probably if you use a micro microscope look really similar to bacteria, but they're also, yeah, they are microscopic and um, only visible with yeah, with special techniques. So basically the yeah, so the um, our life can be split into these three groups, like the archaea, bacteria, and eukaryotes. And um, and the things like the animals and the birds and these things are for all the things that we see day to day are usually animals and plants. Mm -hmm. And if you see all these different lines and different names, there are only really two lines. So there's one line for the animals and one line for the plants. And so these are the things that we surround with every day. But actually the majority of this biodiversity are all microorganisms that are not visible with the bare eyes. So I think microbes are really important because they are um, a large part of the global biodiversity. 
Another reason why I think microbes are really important because they do a lot of things that are important for humans and the environment. So, for example, they um, produce oxygen, they um, convert carbon dioxide to oxygen, um, they're important for degrading organic matter, so earthworms and fungi and bacteria, they're converting the, um, the garden things in the, the, um, in the, comp the leaves and the garden compost and um, Microbes are important for um, developing new medical drugs like antibiotics. Um, they are important for, yeah, to, to providing food like cheese and yeast for bread. They're important for growing crops like nitrogen fixation that gives us nitrogen for the growth of plants. And it's, yeah, you hear more and more in, in the media and science that we're actually, there are a lot of microbes on, on our skin and in our gut. And so they are important for human health. And that's why I think microbes are, yeah, really important. And another reason why I think microbes, well, and, and so, um, I know that I think the slides move, but that's all right. And so, um, and also, um, uh, microbes, um, another reason why microbes are really important is because they're the basis of our food webs. So what's the food web? So the food web is that um, usually, there is a small thing that's eaten by a bigger thing and then it's eaten by another big thing. And so microbes are the bottom of the food web. So there are some microbes like algae that, um, that generate biomass by um, using the sunlight and, and nutrients. And then they're eating, eaten by something else, say by an insect and the insect is eaten by a fish and a fish isn't by humans. And so um, microbes are at the bottom of the food webs and everything relies on their existing. And so that makes it really important that we know what they are, what they're doing, what their ecology is. So because potentially um, if the microbial diversity change, um, it has effect for all the other animals um, and humans that are relying on, on getting um, food from these systems. And so for that, I've got a clip which is from a lake. Um, in, it's a, a clip from small fairy shims and copper pots grazing on algae in an adaptic lake. And that really, I think, shows our food web. So you have the green and brown that are these algae, and you have these tiny shrimps that are grazing on the algae like sheep on, on a meadow. So here you have some in there. You see how they're really ripping off the, the algae. Then here you say two females with um, eggs, they the yellow dots. And then on the left, you see a male who has these big um, mandibles and in their face. Yeah, so these are really, you see how these fairy shrimps rely on the productivity of the algae that are microscopic in order to grow and, and reproduce. So, so I think that's, um, yeah, and so I think it's really exciting to study um, microbiology, but I don't think it's just exciting because they're so important, but because also it's a really um, good time from, in the sense of what technology that we have available. So here um, I'm showing um, another version of this tree of life, but this time it has lots of different colors and lots of dots. So you see again these three domains, you see the eukaryotes, the archaea and bacteria in there, but you also see lots of little dots. And these little dots mean that um, they are these researchers who took all the DNA sequencing from all, all micro um, all organisms they could find and they put them in a tree. And then they had to look how many of these microorganisms and also say um, protist do we actually have seen with our bear, how have we seen we have grown in in the lab we have a culture for them and so what they found was that now we do a lot of sequencing from the environment um, and we have cultures and what they found was that we have they detected signature of microorganisms in the environment that they have never seen in the lab and that the majority of microscopic life we haven't actually cultured yet and we don't know how it looks and what it's doing and so it's a real gap of knowledge because if we don't know how it looks and what they're doing we don't know what they're doing for our food web and for the ecology <coughs> 
yeah, so I think it's a really exciting time because the number of species of microbes is really still unknown. And with new sequencing technologies, um, we're able to sequence a lot more, a lot faster. We have a lot better computers that we can look at big data to um, try to understand how many microbes we have got. And so some people um, did some calculation on how many microbes we might that we have cultured in the lab today and the studies they um, vary between that we only ever were able to culture one percent to up to ten percent in the lab and so that sounds really that up to 99 of organ microorganisms we haven't actually um, any idea of what they are what they do and um, yeah and so it's a very exciting time to use these new technologies to um, discover what the microbiome of the soil of of the lakes and oceans are about. And another reason why um, microbes are really exciting because they can grow in really extreme environments. So here you see um, boulder pavement in the McMurlo Dry Valleys and it's a polar desert. It's one of the most driest places on Earth. Although in, in summer you get some melt um, and you get like streams in it, but still it just looks rocks, stones and water without any life. And so that's also what, um, for example, Captain Scott thought when he went there and he had a look and he said that there was really no living thing around, nothing um, that is um, <coughs> living and it's really a, yeah, a place where everything is dead. But hopefully with DNA, um, DNA sequence, we are now able to, de to detect this invisible life that Scott couldn't see because he didn't have these technologies. And so here, for example, we're in an area that's called Pyramid Trough. And again, you see rocks and mud and stone, and it just looks as if there's not really much happening, not much life. And then if you have a closer look, you see all this black slime around the rocks. And then if you take some samples and you take them to the lab and you have a look under the microscope, you see that there are colored um, organisms in there. And so these are actually algae and they um, produ produce a lot of pigments that make them look, um, that turns the slime into this really dark color. But also what it shows is that you see this, the picture where it's just water and, and stones and it looks as if there's nothing growing. But if you now think that everywhere where you find this water and the slime is actually these photosynthetic algae growing. It's it. Yeah, it shows that there is a lot of life, a lot of photosynthesis happening, and it's actually a productive system. And so what are these um, these algae, these colored um, organisms? So what are cyanobacteria? So I think cyanobacteria are really cool. So they are um, oxygenic phototrophic bacteria. So they're bacteria but they um, are able to, to grow by using um, the sunlight and nutrients to turn that into sugar. And while they're doing it, they're generating oxygen. And they evolved a long, long time ago. They evolved about 2.5 billion years ago, and they were one of the first organisms that are actually able to produce oxygen. And that led to the rise of oxygen on Earth. So before they were there, there was no oxygen in there. And through the evolution of them and the ability to produce oxygen, it was only possible to, for the evolution for all, all of the life that needs oxygen, including us. And so they're really common. So they are found in fresh water, in oceans, and in soils. And people have found out that they're actually really good in living in extreme environments and they're good in living with lots of stress conditions, like, for example, UV radiation, low nutrient concentration, high salt, freezing. So, for example, um, they can turn really orange, and that's because they produce carotenoids. And carotenoids is a pigment that's orange, and that's the same pigment as in, in carrots, and that's why the, the carrot is orange. And so when there's a lot of UV radiation, that can produce a lot of these pigments, and it protects them from damage by the radiation. And because they are so good in growing lots of environments and to deal with lots of stresses, they are very abundant in the polar region, in yeah, in the freshwater systems, and they are producing a lot of the biomass. The biomass that can be found is by cyanobacteria, and they drive the food webs there. 
And so here, yeah, so there, here are some um, microscopy images. So they have lots of shapes and forms and colors, and they have a really big microscope um, morphological diversity. And sometimes in some regions, they can actually grow to become really well, huge, um, they become really big. So there's one type that's called nostoc, and it can form into these big slimy sheets um, that you can see with your eyes. And, and this photo was taken in the Arctic, but actually they're very common all around the world. So um, for a while I was very excited about nostoc, so I talked with all my colleagues about nostoc, and so various colleagues from the various suburbs in London brought me some of the nostoc they would find in autumn and winter in their gardens. And so, yeah, so they, they can grow really well and make these um, slimy structures. And actually, as a fun fact, people have even um, taken Nostock to the International Space Station and exposed it to um, space um, radiation, and then they brought it back and it was able to, to continue growing. And so that shows how they're able to deal with lots of different extreme um, stresses. Then um, cyanobacteria are also really interesting because they can found from pole to pole. So they are, can be found in the Arctic, in the Antarctic, and um, now quite a while ago, like 2010, um, both poles, and we were interested um, in the question, do we find the same cyanobacteria in the Arctic and the Antarctic? And what we found was with now kind of outdated methods that um, really similar cyanobacteria can be found in the Arctic and the Antarctic, and they were really abundant in both poles, but they were couldn't really be found in, in temperate and tropical environments. And so that <coughs> made us interested in the question, why are they so similar and how can it be that um, these really similar organisms evolved at really, yeah, really far apart? And so they are, um, so yeah, and we still continue with the work. So now um, we are applying um, DNA sequencing technologies, but we still haven't quite um, figured out why why they're so similar and so far apart. And so now, yeah, so I talked a little bit um, how microbes are really abundant and how actually there is a lot of life, but it, life looks a little bit different to what we're used to living um, in the cities or even in the countryside. And so now um, here, this is a flyover by helicopter over the McMahdo ice shelf. And um, you will see it so that you have, this is an ice shelf. So actually, if you drill a hole, um, you would get to the ocean and you have lots of meltwater ponds there. And then the bottom of these ponds are covered in orangey brown um, layers. And actually, all of the orange color are these um, cyanobacteria forming biofilms. And again, it's just the ice is not dead. It's not abiotic. It's actually full of life. It just looks different. So this is when yeah you fly with a helicopter over um, these meltwater ponds. And anywhere where you see orange, it's actually algae growing and thriving and um, doing photosynthesis in the middle of Antarctica. So this is when you then land and you work and you have a closer look at these ponds. So you get these big orange sheets of um, these cyanobacterial thick biofilms that we also call microbial mats. And in winter they freeze, but and then in summer, in, in summer when it's um, when they're melted, they continue growing. And so this is now when you um, yeah, have a look underwater and it's a sunny day or there's enough light for photosynthesis, you can really see how they do photosynthesis and produce gas bubbles. And so here you see all the orange colored kind of slime, which are these cyanobacterial mats. And then they're producing um, lots of gases, a lot of carbon, and um, shows that they're living and um, growing. And so this is then if you um, take one of these um, samples and you have a closer look, and then turns out that these biofilms are just not, not just slime, they're actually structured. So they're like these miniature um, cast these miniature tropical forests where you have different organisms living in different layers. 
So the cyanobacteria are like the trees in the tropical forest that give the structure. And then you have different um, microorganisms living in different layers. So at the top, they're again super orange. And that's because there are lots of UV screening pigments because there's more UV stress. Then further down, they are green because they are green because they are um, what well, they do photosynthesis with chlorophyll. And but they don't need to produce the um, UV screens anymore. And then you have other um, um, organisms at the bottom that can grow without light. And so then before that was the melt pond. And here you see Lake Vanda, which is an ice perennial ice covered lake in Antarctica, which means it's it has some permanent ice cover, which is several meters thick, but it has some meltwater running in and out during the summer. So it's not um, totally ice, um, isolated from the surrounding environment. And what's also amazing with the lake is that the light can still get through the ice. And so then when you go into the lake, you see structures like this. So this is an environment that's really extreme. So you don't get any insects or any fish in the lake. And so um, everything is microbes and the mic microbes can grow without being grazed by other organisms. And then they can form these amazing um, yeah, fairy castle structures. And then they are not in one spot and they actually cover all of the lake because they are there, there's no disturbance and they can grow for many, many years. And then, um, so then you find these these microbial structures, tropical forest or cities, not only in, in on ice shelves and in meltwater in one lake, you find it in many lakes and um, and you can dif find different um, types of microbial um, communities in different lakes. And part of our research, we're interested to find out how comes that they look really different in different lakes, um, even though it's all just microbes. And so, so it helps us to study the diversity and ecology in these Antarctic lakes, but some of these structures can also be have study systems for life on early Earth. So some of these structures, so this amazing image was taken by a colleague, Dale Anderson at SETI, who um, went diving there and took these pictures. And, um, and these structures can be used to look, to study um, by studying the system, it might help us to understand how life looks like when there was only microbes around. And so, yeah, so there is this huge biodiversity and there's actually a lot of um, these unique microbial systems. Um, and so, yeah, so it's all it's about biodiversity. But then as you all you follow the news and what you read in your textbook, there is um, warming predicted for the polar regions and um, climate model predict that there's more rapid warming in high higher latitudes so what means there's going to be more rapid warming in the arctic than and and the antarctic than more in the temperate environments and um and even though the warming and the impact can be really variable and it can be in different signs i've um been to some sites where we noticed we could actually observe this and that was really um, quite striking and frightening. So for, for example here this is quite a while ago 2008 was a year when it was very warm similar to um, 2020 um, and so one of the big ice shelves in the Arctic was lost the Markham ice shelf which is 20 square miles so it's similar to the size of Manhattan. And actually, we were on the way to go sampling there. And then um, a colleague of my boss rang and said, well, we just looked at the satellite and the ice shelf was gone. And so it broke out out of a fjord into the ocean just within a few days. And so that's how it actually lost. So in summer 2007, we were sampling on the ice shelf and it looks kind of as if we are on land. And then when we tried to come back in 2008, it was all gone um, and it was it looked like a fjord. And so, um, yeah, and so there are these changes due to warming. And um, 
see this kind of warming is discussed um, a lot in context of changing habitats for, say, polar bears. But there's also some implication for um, microbial system. So on these, these ice shelves, they are full of these microbial um, these microbial um, biofilms, and they're actually producing a lot of biomass. I mean, it might not be as cute as a polar bear, but it's a lot of biomass and they're growing and they're doing photosynthesis. And so there is a lot of biological life that is lost when the ice shelves are lost. And also there might be um, new species or we might be able, able to find new medical drugs from these systems that we are now not able to discover. And so this was in 2008, and as I mentioned before, last year was the year that it was really warm. And so I received this slide from a colleague in Canada. So at the top, you see an image taken by Adrian White um, showing Luke Copland on the Millen Fjord. And again, it just looks like this beautiful ice landscape. And, and if it's just like covered by snow, but it's an ice shelf. And um, between the 30th of July and the 6th of August, the ice shelf um, broke out. And so you see at the bottom, you see these satellite images. So there were the first cracks or really cracks in the ice that were visible from the centennial radar images by the Canadian Ice Service. Then in August the 2nd, it got wider. In 2006, it started breaking off. And so again, through that one a big ecosystem was lost. And these are all yeah, indicator of more rapid warming in the Canadian Arctic. Um, yeah, and other things we have observed, for example, in the McMurdo Dry Valley. So here you see an, um, another ice covered lake. And in these lakes, they have observed more rapid lake level rise. So on the, um, these images were provided by Ian Haas from New Zealand. And on the left, you see um, a satellite Im well, an image of the lake. You see um, the white is um, the ice cover. And then you see the white lines are the um, cover what the lake is now. So the white is from 1947 on the left. And then um, in the 2000s, the lake has risen um, by several meters and is now a lot wider. So you see on the right how the ice is a lot bigger area. And so the water level rise um, was more than two meters in the last 10 years. And so what does it mean for the microbial life in living in there? And so this again is amazing Im image by Dale Anderson who went diving there. And so you see these kind of beige structures and these all used to be these um, pigmented purple and orange colored microbial structures similar to Lake Vanda and Lake Untersee that I showed in the previous slides. And um, due to the lake level rise, they are now deeper in the water. It meant they're not getting enough light to grow. So these structures are slowly dying because um, of the lake level rise. And now, and, and so these things are happening in lakes. And then um, in the UK and in, in Europe, there is this amazing project going um, happening called Black and Bloom with some of the um, 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 participant being in the audience where though in the audience of our British Phycological meeting and that project they're interested looking at the algae that are living on the surface on ice sheets like the Greenland ice sheet and um, and these um, algae they're growing they're producing um, dark their pigments and they're being more dark it will increase the melting of where they are and potentially if they are um, more algae growing and the um, the glaciers getting more dark because of the algae, it might have an effect on the melting of the ice of this ice sheet. And so that shows that the microbes are, are not just sort of affected by change, but they're actually interacting with the ice and the, the kind of the, yeah, the ice environment and, and really interacting in some of the process that might be related to climate change. So how could we study algae to help climate change research? So that was the question that we sort of, we asked us when we were in a dark set, so how can we do it? And then we were thinking about that, well, okay, I actually live, I work, well not live, but sometimes feel like living. I, am, um, I work at a museum where we have a lot of old collections and potentially going to the museum, opening the cupboards and looking at, at these really old collections might help us to um, establish new baseline data from these old collections. And with that, we got interested in Scott 
Captain Scott because Captain Scott traveled several times, as you know, to Antarctica to discover the South Pole. And um, in one of his earlier expedition, the Discovery Expedition 1901-1904, they went down to explore, to see if they find a way to the South Pole, but they didn't plan yet to go there. And um, so they were interested in this exploration thing, but they also were really keen scientists. And so they went there and they, um, and it was called the British National Antarctic Expedition, but they also did many scientific records and collection. And that included um, descriptions of the cyanobacteria from Antarctica. And on the right, you see these really beautiful um, small drawings that they did from the samples they found in Antarctica. And um, yeah, so they went there and they collected samples and they also brought some of the samples back and they're stored at the Natural History Museum. And so therefore we decided to re-examine Captain Scott's polar samples from 100 years ago. Um, on the image you see um, one of the huts that was built by Scott, um, which is now at the edge of McMurdo, one of the US Antarctic stations. And so we were particularly interested to re-examine these Captain Scott samples, not just because they were old and they were one of the first samples they were collected. We were also interested in it because these samples were collected before human activity in Antarctica, the ozone hole and um, current levels of climate change. So they could really be our first um, baseline data um, yeah, that we can obtain from these kind of samples. And so here you see one of the samples that we found. So we found these, yeah, really quite well. They don't, they don't look, I guess, very exciting, but still really cool to see that you have these dried biofilms that are still green from the from the um, chlorophyll inside, preserved in in cardboard for 100 years in a cupboard. So we were very excited um, to find them and work with them. And so what we did was that we um, took um, these, we um, worked with the old samples, but we also collected um, new samples from similar locations to compare them. And then um, what we did was we used DNA sequencing to compare the cyanobacteria in the old and the new samples. And what we found was um, that the um, the old samples and the new samples had really similar cyanobacteria in there. And so we are really happy about that because that suggests that um, cyanobacteria, these algae that live in Antarctica, um, haven't really changed yet due to um, human impact and um, the, any climate change that might have occurred in these regions. And what we also did was that we looked for toxins in there. So some cyanobacteria produce toxins. And so we were able to find these toxins. And so the DNA data and these toxin data are now the one of the oldest baseline data for these regions. And hopefully they will help us um, in the future to look at um, issues like um, detecting the invasive species. So for example, if we are now we have now this old data and if we get new samples and we found species in there that weren't in the old samples but in the new samples and they may be um, more similar to samples in the UK, it suggests that they were maybe introduced by humans to Antarctica. And these samples might also help us to probe the impact of future warming. And so yeah, and so working with these, with old samples and new samples, um, showed us that the legacy of Scott's expedition, that there is a really big legacy of Scott's expedition, that there, these samples now allow us to, to look at research questions that Scott never thought that would exist. I mean, they didn't think of climate change. And so now having these samples allow us to study climate change. And that really um, also shows that it's, um, yeah, that it's really good to collect samples and store them because there might be technologies or there might be science questions that we have to look at in the future and we just can't travel back in time and to collect samples. So it's really important to collect science samples in a way that they're well preserved and that we can um, use them to study future science challenges. And with that, um, I would like to wrap up and conclude. So yeah, the polar environments are really amazing, unique environments. They're very extreme and in most parts, um, animals and plants can't survive. And so these systems um, look 
was there are really um, yeah, abiotic and sterile, nothing there, but really there is this incredible microbial diversity that's hidden in the lakes, in the grounds, and um, cyanobacteria are especially important in these systems. And um, by looking, using modern samples, going to the polar regions, in a, um, going there, studying them, and comparing them with old collections, um, like the ex ex um, samples by Scott, might help us to, to help the research into climate research. And so with that, um, I want to thank a lot of people who have been to expeditions because expeditions can, cannot be done um, on your own. So you're always in big teams, they are international teams, and you have to work with a lot of people because it's a harsh environment and you need lots of people to help. Um, for work and socializing. And so, yeah, the work wouldn't be possible without big teams um, doing really cool science. And then um, also to get there takes a lot of time and it's really um, complicated logistics. And so over the year, we have received lots of support by lots of funding, energy funding agencies from lots of different countries. And with that, I would like to say thank you and take any questions. Thank you. Well, thanks very, thanks for that, and it's absolutely fascinating. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever heard anyone use Antarctica and Sirius in the same sentence before. We've got. Over 200 people watching the live stream and some questions appearing in the chat box. They've clearly piqued some people's interest. One question here, lovely photos. Many must have been taken on relatively sunny days, but how cold and wet can it get when you're camping in the Antarctic in the summer? So, yeah, great question. So, um, yeah, um, okay, so myself. Yeah, so it can range. So it depends where you go. So um, so the coldest we've probably been, so when you go to the McMurdo Dry Valleys, it's always minus degrees. So we probably were camping with maybe minus 10 degrees. And then um, if you get the wind chill, so when it's really windy, it's even colder. So I had, um, yeah, had like chocolate and water bottles frozen in my tent. OK, now. Here comes a, a, a question to get your head around. Where does all the toilet waste go to? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, so at the end, because I knew that the talk will be on YouTube, I decided not to show the pictures. But yeah, it's it's a really important question. So it's, so if we work in really extreme environments and um, like the McMurdo Dry Valleys, and there are no animals. So if we would just go behind the tent um, and leave a little present there, it would be a huge impact to the system because there are no animal, nothing there. And so we talk a lot about grave water. And so everything, um, and so everything you take in, you have to take out. So all the water from cooking and dishwashers and from the Thailand, we have to collect in barrels and take back in the helicopter and so it's always very important to close the lid properly because you want to um, not get into trouble with the um, with the pilot and for the others we actually have um, toilet tents for everything else that we have to take back in a bucket okay thanks a lot for that um i'm gonna just pick a few questions out and i'm going to move on to some more sort of serious scientific questions so, um, <clears throat> does the 24 hour daylight impact the growth of organisms and do you ever do studies during the Arctic winter or is that just too difficult? Yeah, great question. So, um, so for the organisms, they will, um, so organisms that need light to grow, growing with 24 sun, um, sunshine is really good so they can grow more, but it's actually um, not known yet how so if you would have the same cyanobacteria in, in in Europe where you have night and day and you take them to Antarctica, you don't know, we don't actually know how it, it affects them because cyanobacteria have genes like we like these circadian clock genes. So they are 
they were evolved with the ability to deal with day and night. So, so we don't actually know exactly how the same cyanobacter behave differently with daylight or 24 hours, but they grow better. So that was the first one. The second question is, so theoretically, it'd be possible to go to the Arctic and the Antarctic, but most research is done during summer because the logistics of getting there in winter is just so hard and so complicated that it's not done a lot. But it actually creates this really big research gap because we don't really know what's happening there in winter. OK, thanks. <clears throat> Another question asking about the isopods that you um, included in one of your video clips. Are they specific to one lake or have you found them to be widespread? So, so the, these um, images were taken on Sydney Island and there are, um, I think, about 16 lakes on, um, on the island. And um, they are found in the lakes that are most productive. So it means the lakes where you have most algae growth grows, you will get these, um, yeah, these crustaceans, the, the fairy shrimps in there. Okay. And um, <clears throat> well, lots of the comments we've got on Teams are admiring your photographs, or the photographs of you and your, Thank your you. colleagues. Um, <clears throat> so um, one more question here. Do you see the same cyanotoxins as we find in temperate regions? These are the toxic compounds produced by cyanobacteria, which are quite common, as you know, in the temperate regions. So are there the same toxins in the um, poles? Yes, yeah, so, so they are the same toxins. However, what's interesting is that the species that are mostly, that are the most common toxin producers in temperate and tropical environments are not present in Antarctica. So um, species that are either haven't been found here or are not that common producing the toxins there. OK, and just one last problem, one last question, sorry, on the, well, actually on the logistics of it all. How, how long do you spend planning and preparing your sampling for, in these remote areas? And how long do you stay there? How long are the trips that you spend? Um, and how so, long, then how long do you need when you get back to, um, to London to process all those samples? So yeah, so it takes a lot of planning. So, um, so usually the planning can start six months before the trip because we need to find the funding, but we also need to apply for a lot of permits. There are environmental regulations and um, different authorities that have to agree for us to go and collect samples. So the planning will start um, yeah, easily six months beforehand. And then it depends. Um, so I've done anything from two weeks to six weeks in, in the polar region. So it depends on how we travel there. So um, once we did field work that was closer to the main New Zealand station so they could fly us to the station, we did our work and then we went back two weeks later to New Zealand because there were planes. But then when I traveled on South Georgia where no regular plane, um, pla there are no planes, there are only boats, um, you have to stay until the next boat comes and picks you up. And so that can be longer. And then, yeah, we collect a lot of samples. And I think so some samples might be so there might be um, students who are really keen to find out about the samples. So then they get processed really quickly. But then, yeah, there are many samples that we will work on for many, many years. OK, just um, two questions to finish off. Would it be possible to use drones or robotics to collect data like they do in the deep oceans to combat the conditions? Yeah, great question. So there's a lot of interest in drones in the polar regions. So um, it's where well, the drones allow to, ex to collect data remotely and it might able to get to places without damage the ground, without walking there and get to places it's just too hard to hike. And so there's some work where people um, 
work on the algae. So these algae, they produce color. And so you can say color with drones. And so there's a lot of interest to map algae in the smeltwater ponds and also on glaciers to see how many algae are living in these environments. OK, we've got one really great question to finish with, but I'm going to sneak one question for a very quick answer in because it's something close to my heart. Um, we saw Cook's drawings of cyanobacteria and one diatom. Are diatoms common? Yes, yeah, so it depends on the So Diamonds are very common. It's only in very unusual conditions um, that they cannot be found. So there we found one lake where there are no diatoms, but otherwise there are always diatoms in the lakes or streams. OK, and here's the very last question for you then. Um, if we find there was once life on Mars, do you think it will have been similar to these extremophile cyanobacterial mats? Well, it, well, it's um, I guess these um, well, the studying life in the in really extreme environments helps us to understand like under what conditions um, life could have survived. And so, if we find conditions that are similar. Um, it, yeah, it gives us clues on how life might have looked out. I don't know if it would really look like the Antarctic mats, but we can get a lot of clues of these really extreme environments on on what kind of organisms or what environment they would have needed. So yeah, so astrobiology and exobiology are really important topics. OK, we'll draw proceedings to a close now. So once again, thank you to everyone who attended our live stream of the lecture and especially a big thank you to Anne Jungblut for her fascinating talk. So the rest of you, enjoy the rest of your evening and stay safe. Thank you. Are we? Uh, yeah, so I think I th you're no longer spotlighted. Are we still on YouTube or has it stopped?